Welcome, welcome everybody. Um, thank you uh, so much for being here today, taking the time of your life to um, know more about psychedelic science and psychotherapy. I'm really grateful uh, to be here and uh, to be sharing all of this with our speakers. Um, so this is the second edition of the Swiss uh, Academic Psychedelic uh, Science Conference. And uh, my name is Federico Serragnoli. I'm the coordinator of this project. I'm a psychologist. And uh, the first thing I would like really to do is to thank the volunteers that uh, were there, uh, that are working with this uh, foundation we, that we founded. Um, so we are all uh, there, uh, students or uh, professionals, but uh, as for our in engagement in this uh, project, we are all volunteers. And um, I really would like to, to thank uh, all of us and all of them. And please, uh, uh, yeah, this, is, uh, this would not be possible without uh, a collective work uh, going on. Because, of course, uh, in our private life, uh, we have... Um, our, um, um, we are students, some are students, some has a, a job already. And uh, of course one of, the, one of the drives that got us here was uh, um, around uh, this, this questioning like, but how could we get a job in psychedelics? How, like, if only we could be psychedelic researcher, right? And um, yeah, for some of us it's happening and uh, um, for our speakers, it's also the case uh, for some time right now. Okay, thank you so much. <laughs> um, as you know, we are going through a psychedelic so-called renaissance, um, a, a development of this field that has been uh, um, asleep maybe for some decades because of uh, um, restrictions on the medical use and the research on these substances. And uh, I am just showing you here two seminal uh, works from uh, uh, Roland Griffith, which is working um, in uh, John Hopkins uh, University, and Franz Wollenweider, which was uh, working in psychiatric hospital in Zurich University. So in the first one we see, it's 2006, um, psilocybin can occasion mystical type experiences having substantial and sustained personal meaning and spiritual significance. So this was really a psychopharmacologist uh, interested himself in meditation, and at some point he had that legitimacy to basically bring back psychedelic research. Um, I also quote here Franz Vollenweider, which is a Swiss researcher uh, still working uh, nowadays. I say that because this uh, work is from 1998, and this was the paper that uh, basically uh, um, revealed us the fact that psychedelics are agonists of this uh, serotonin H2TN receptor. Of course, uh, other signs of this renaissance going on uh, are in the media. So we, we've seen recently in July this uh, um, series on Netflix. Uh, Switzerland uh, is there depicted sometimes, uh, Basel University, in, uh, yeah, so it's, uh, it's also to say, um, we, we will see the, the, yeah, the, the, the specificity of this country for this field during this presentation. So, a job in psychedelics. Imagine uh, a world in which at some point um, we will have uh, psychedelic-assisted psychotherapy widely available in uh, hospitals and uh, psychiatric units in uh, universities. Um, so if it's your job, you wake up, it's a Monday morning, and uh, as a, a psychologist, as a nurse, as a medical doctor, you go uh, to your workplace. It's a psychedelic unit in the public hospital of your uh, uh, city where you live. And there you um, propose a psychedelic-assisted psychotherapy with, uh, for example, LSD and psilocybin, not within a research setting, but really as a, um, as a health uh, uh, possibility, as a mental health uh, mm, proposal for the whole population of your uh, city. 
And uh, of course, when you have a unit like that, you can do research um, on questionnaires and also uh, on specific kind of uh, um, issues in mental health. And also you can create uh, intervision groups for all the psychiatrists, even in the private sector, in their private cabinet that wants to do this kind of work. So you have uh, people coming together, working as therapists in psychedelic assisted psychotherapy, discussing cases and uh, being there to, to learn from each other. This is uh, yeah, something you could do. And also you can create some training, right, to, to all this multidisciplinary team that is uh, involved uh, in, uh, in uh, this. These are screenshots from the website of the Geneva University Hospital. So this is uh, a reality today in Switzerland. Um, I'm showing you this uh, to show you that uh, this is normal. This is uh, one way on how it should be. A hospital providing a specific kind of psychotherapy with the substances like any other kind of psychotherapy. So it's a very good news for Switzerland that uh, we are allowed to do this. Uh, so we, as if we were not already uh, privileged enough in this country. And yet, pain and suffering has no privilege. It's also a bad news then, because uh, most of the country on earth uh, cannot afford to Mm. practice this kind of psychotherapy, which is already being shown as very uh, useful in many cases for addiction, PTSD, and um, anxiety, depression, and we will see all of the potential of this during these three days. Eh? In any case, it's a challenging news, I think, because to implement this in a society, it's um, a lot of work, a lot of carefulness, and um, a lot of education. I think it's uh, important to, to, to speak here a little bit also about the education because when we prepare a patient to undergo uh, through psychedelic assisted psychotherapy, uh, we should know how, for example, we should know he, his own uh, um, um, cultural background. And uh, Switzerland is very also special in this sense since uh, it's a four uh, language, uh, four official language uh, country. And uh, as you can see, normally you have uh, at least 37% of the population as an average in Switzerland uh, being uh, first or second generation immigrants. So they are Swiss, they like fondue and they live uh, there with their jobs and uh, they really are part of our community in Switzerland, but their uh, roots come from elsewhere. Uh, in Geneva, this is even... Uh, oops, sorry. In Geneva, this is even... Uh, <laughs> spoiler. <laughs> In Geneva, this is even uh, worse, eh? in the sense that 62% of the people in this canton comes as are from first or second generation immigration routes. Um, so we have to prepare them to undergo this psychedelic experience. And how do we do that? When we think about uh, uh, the traditional use of psychedelics, uh, uh, basically, we have uh, cultures using their own substances in their own way, in their own traditional uh, setting. Uh, the people participating in this traditional uh, usage of psychedelics are all from the same culture, so they have this um, language altogether. They, ha they share the same meanings and the same representations of reality. Um, so you have here two examples for ayahuasca and psilocybin. Um, so what should we do when we have uh, a person coming from South America at the hospital? Should we prepare a setting related to her own roots from the cultural use that uh, uh, her own uh, country and her own culture uh, would have done? Or, um, and then should we apply this and prepare a different setting for any person coming from a different culture? So this is very, very difficult and important discussion, and uh, I mean it, uh, meaning that we don't have the answer yet, but uh, in a um, perspective of uh, effective altruism, what we want to do is already to offer this kind of treatment, 
which is what we are doing because we have the legal right to do so in Switzerland. So basically, um, we do it uh, in the most careful way, uh, preparing uh, this uh, session, trying to be at the same page, meaning really asking a lot of questions to these uh, patients, right? Where are you from? What are your beliefs about the world? Um, really trying to touch all the things that should be important for a person to undergo through a psychedelic experience. Most of them, they never had any psychoactive consumption in their life. So, to, need, uh, to, to know more also about this setting and about uh, us all, I would like to ask you a question, and you can answer by raising your hand. Um, who has never been to a psychedelic conference before? So you can also see yourself eh, to, to see how many of you are. I would say uh, a rough estimation, let's say a little bit like uh, maybe half of you. So as a scientific academic conference, uh, it will be enough to just have a rough estimation of a data. No, this is not working. So please, if you have five minutes during this weekend, you can just go to the booklet and scan this QR code that will bring you to a demographic survey with some uh, infos uh, that we will show basically at the end of the conference to you to let you know where do you come from, who you are, what's your job, and then you will see some questions. This, I think, is also important to know each other, to know also the kind of people interested in this. We will uh, also be able to see then the difference in, uh, in the years, maybe in any case. This, I thought it was uh, useful for us to, to really also show you as a group, uh, to show our, us, in fact, as a group, who we are, where we come from. At the end of the conference, we will show you the, the pie charts for this. So if you want to be uh, at the same page, um, I think um, there are at least three uh, very, very important issues to be touched in preparing people to understand the psychedelic experience. So the first one, of course, is consciousness. Since uh, we are dealing with uh, an alteration of the state of consciousness with psychedelics. So this will be a slide, consciousness in one slide. So brace yourself. Um, consciousness is a, an embodied, dynamic, self-reflective, trainable process. It's embodied. So our emotions create an alteration in our state of consciousness. Uh, this can be, of course, it's, uh, it's uh, familiar to us, right? When we are sad, we see things in a certain way. We cannot, uh, uh, things, yeah, we have like these uh, high glasses with, uh, that are colored in blue or uh, the color of depression, right? And, uh, they, and the emotions really do um, change our state of consciousness. So this to say, as a first uh, step, that uh, consciousness is a um, function of the human being, which is a biopsychosocial, at least, uh, um, um, system. So you really should uh, always remember that in any case, the state of consciousness is related to the body. It's uh, embodied as a function of the human mind. Also, consciousness uh, is uh, dynamic. Um, when we uh, speak about uh, state of consciousness, of course, uh, it's a continuum eh, in the different forms of life. So, of course, uh, other like uh, any given form of life that has a self-perception, we could argue, has a certain form of consciousness. consciousness. Um, in any case, we are uh, um, also uh, changing this kind of uh, function during uh, the lifetime. So the consciousness of a baby, of a two years old human, is not, uh, has not, the same, is not doing the same thing as the consciousness of a uh, 40 years old uh, human. Um, as, uh, also, when we age, uh, consciousness can change, and the more uh, we age, the more we can have uh, some uh, um, problems related to the changement of our state of consciousness. Uh, of course, the self-reflectivity as a function of the state of consciousness is also different in ages. Uh, the child, uh, 
we uh, should assume, uh, like we assume in an elementary way. So all of this that I'm saying, we could argue for every sentence on hours on this, right? But uh, let's say that uh, a child has not the same level of self-awareness than an adult human being. And uh, self-awareness, self-reflection, this self-reflective property of consciousness is around the fact that we create a model of our self perceiving the world inside our self. So, as you can see here, for example, this, this human uh, watching this, uh, this uh, moon, let's say, is creating an image of himself watching that moon. And then, what's the difference between the real moon, that is the real moon that is outside there, and the moon that we perceive that is a product of our consciousness, of our perception, that is a representation inside ourself. So in this sense, um, um, consciousness, when we speak about self-awareness, uh, can also be conceived as a dialogue, right? So you would have, uh, at some point, uh, for example, when you make a lapsus, uh, someone there telling you, ah, you see, I was right. Uh, consciousness is a matter of dialogue between different instances. and. Um, of course, it's also a matter of, in this sense, um, the int integration of the perspectives of other human beings. So this starts with the fact that we are taught as children to attribute a mental state to other humans and to things, and then we start um, turning that on ourselves, attributing ourselves things. Um, and that's what happens. This is an infinite loop of meta, 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 metacognition. There are a lot of jokes around this because uh, I think this is one of the um, specificity of the human mind and uh, I find it very cool. So in this sense, uh, uh, one thing that uh, we find ourselves having to explain also, uh, imagine to a person that never took any psychoactive substances, that never had a particular interest in understanding your own consciousness, is that consciousness is not a monologue. And they do uh, sometimes think so. The moment you tell them that it's a dialogue, uh, this lets uh, them be able to uh, diffuse from the monologue going on and uh, uh, accept or see that there are other perspectives. And uh, this uh, can really be useful for psychotherapy. Consciousness is also a trainable process. So I think if we have this level of self-awareness, it's because we developed in our history of humans um, uh, tools, literacy tools, to, uh, in fact, uh, uh, to create representation of this world that we perceive. And uh, one of these tools, of course, is uh, uh, like language. So at some point we start learning uh, language and by reading it, for example, so well, by speaking, it, but then we start reading it. And while we read a book, of course, we can feel uh, sometimes with that particular book that marked our life a transformative experience. Because that was uh, um, a, a representation that we integrated in our state of consciousness and then in our life, in our narration, in this sense, uh, sorry, in this sense here. So it's a trainable process. You can really mm, educate yourself uh, in being human, basically. Meaning uh, knowing uh, yourself and the others and culture and uh, what's all of this about and asking yourself a lot of questions. Um, one other way to train consciousness is to write. Uh, there are scientific uh, solid evidences on the fact that when we write around our state of consciousness and around our emotions, this really helps us uh, to deal with uh, uh, struggles. And in any case, this also teaches the consciousness to, to go at another speed, for example. But this is a whole literature, I, but I mean, it's beautiful. And it's just to show you that, that there's a way to train it also by writing. And then, of course, you can train it in a more, uh, even more embodied way. Uh, for example, with meditation. And in that sense, uh, it's about uh, um, understanding uh, the tool that we have of attention. To put this attention somewhere instead of somewhere else. To have the, the control, but then to let it go. Meditation, you know, there are a lot of techniques, a lot of cultural diversity with this uh, tool. Um, psychedelics, of course, uh, are also a tool to 
train consciousness and to transform it as a function in the human mind. And um, we are on the verge of understanding a little bit this. Uh, we are on, on the verge of starting asking really the question from a scientific perspective. Of course, we know a lot from the ages, but the, the scientific tool arrived uh, in the last years. Uh, it doesn't mean that in the end um, you can just um, um, uh, jump start your, uh, your enlightenment with uh, uh, psychedelics, but uh, of course uh, there's a lot to, to study there. So, um, this is our uh, guest for the presentation. It's Amina bird. It's a bird that is uh, that lived in uh, in the Pala Island. So Pala Island is the uh, island from Aldous Huxley novel The Island, eh? where uh, our first uh, student association took the name. And um, in this society, where they basically learned and uh, um, they are educated in using psychedelics as a as a as a treatment as well in mental health. In this uh, uh, society, they they trained birds to go around in this island and to chant some words that are really important for them to have some moments of uh, awareness, to have some, some priming from the external context to have them uh, uh, recenter themselves again. So it's like uh, going around and then you, s you, you hear a bird passing by because he lives there in your ecosystem saying at some point, attention! And every time you, you hear it passing by, oh yes, I can stay in the present moment, I can diffuse from my thinking, I can uh, appreciate. So this is one of the words that uh, the Mina birds um, are taught to, uh, to chant in this uh, utopian uh, um, uh, world. Another important component of uh, the psychedelics is psychotherapy and psychedelics in general. It's wonder. So wonder feels like uh, a sense of awe that is very difficult to express in words, which is the drive for curiosity and discovery. Of course, I'm a human being, so this is my subjective uh, way of depicting that for this presentation. When we deal with uh, psychedelics and psychotherapy, we saw it in the first paper uh, I showed you, it's uh, about uh, this mystical experience. So, imagine we have to try to find ways to, to, to represent this mystical experience um, to people that never had it, to represent this uh, mystical experience without religious connotation as well. So it's a sense of awe, really. And uh, um, you can find this picture at the last uh, page of the booklet. And next to the picture, there is also the text that the person that uh, had the idea to take it uh, has written. It's like a poem. And this is the farthest uh, away selfie that humanity has ever taken of ourselves. So maybe there are now, with new techniques, uh, other that are even more far away. But the idea is that um, when we... Uh, so Please, if you have five minutes during this uh, conference, you, you just go and read uh, what Carl Sagan said about wonder and about this sense of uh, awe when we realize uh, the complexity and um, the incredible uh, chance that we have, uh, I think, in being uh, self-aware uh, entities in this world, in this universe, which is so vast. And why you think about this, that vastness? Can you spot your ego? So, from that distance, can you still uh, fusion with your problems, with uh, your goals, with, uh, or maybe you can, for a moment, uh, just uh, realize this uh, puzzlement. So this is also why we speak about ego dissolution for uh, psychedelic experiences. And uh, as you can see, uh, it's very difficult to express that in words. I'm trying my best, but I see that uh, I would like to, 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 to make it better. Uh, of course, when you try to picture the vastity of uh, a planet, uh, um, 
in your mind as a representation of the magnitude of the complexity of the distance of the of everything that's going on in history, etc., in every moment for every people in his own state of consciousness. I mean, this is very difficult. So how do you express this? How do you study this uh, from the point of view of science? Uh, scientists, they like uh, to have ideas, they search for them, and then at some point they have insights. So they found uh, a way to do this. They uh, remanaged the mystical experience questionnaire for psychedelics. This was a questionnaire already used for natural occurring mystical experiences. We saw that psychedelic experiences were somewhat alike, so we tried to use the same questionnaire. And uh, when we have to deal with this difficulty to express in words, uh, let's do uh, the meta game of language. Let's find a category to state how much we cannot put a category on that thing. So this is sense that the experience cannot be described adequately in words. And then you quote this from one to five. So to which extent you cannot, to which ex quote, to which extent you cannot quote the experience you're living. And uh, somehow it works. In any case, uh, there's a lot to do if you have any ideas. Uh, um, I think uh, this idea of wonder is really also uh, very important for the scientific community. So here again is a um, quote from Carl Sagan. I, I think uh, science requires an almost complete openness to all ideas. On the other hand, it requires the most rigorous and uncompromising skepticism. So. Um, sometimes we hear also this, qu this, uh, this quote, uh, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Mm, but this doesn't mean that magic exists. This means that uh, if uh, a middle-aged man would come in this room, he would be, uh, not just a sense of awe, maybe a good story, but he would be really struck from the fact that uh, I can uh, um, automatically, for example, amplify the volume of my voice, that there are uh, fires not moving and maybe even cold uh, giving lights to this room. So for him it would be magic, but for us, since we know about uh, how, um, how it works, it's not magic, but in fact we don't know how it works. We just assume that if we could educate ourselves enough, given enough time, given enough resources, we could recreate, uh, let's say, a, a television screen. Because there are humans being able to do so, because they studied them, because it's a history of development with an evidence-based method, meaning that is uh, replicable. Okay. So what would the mina bird uh, sing to let us remember about this wonder? Eh? They sing in this romance, eh? they sing uh, here and now, boys. So again, remember who, who, who the complexity of, of all of this. Uh, one other way to say it uh, from uh, the world of John Searle uh, would be to imagine, for example, this mental experiment. So there's a person entering in a room she sit down, there's another person coming. Then the person that just sat down says the word. A co there's the words, a coffee please. Then the person that came, go away, come back with a liquid on a cup, give it to this person, this person drinks it, this person that entered this room leaves some metal coins on the desk and then goes away. Very simple. A person getting in a coffee to drink a coffee. But uh, imagine the metaphysical weight, John Searle would say, uh, the metaphysical weight of this situation. If you want to understand completely what's going on, you have to put a culture there, you have to put uh, all of this uh, socialization of these people, knowing what they have to do, habits, and then you have to put... Uh, what is money, and then you have to put, uh, and everything else. And this is always the case in every moment of our daily life. So, 
if you just uh, get back here now, you can feel this sense of puzzlement if, it, if it's not a sense of awe and wonder. And being completely sober. Another uh, component is, of course, compassion. And compassion implies uh, a theory of mind, realizing prosociality, because we are all we are all natural born altruists. So, a theory of mind, of course, if you feel compassion, in, in embedded in this notion of willing to care for the other person and feeling the other person's pain, but you have to have another person there. You have to um, um, yeah, um, mentalize something there. You have to attribute a mental state and some suffering there. Of course, if I think that there is no suffering going on on an animal or on a plant, I can just use them as objects. And this is also the strange things with, the, or the puzzling, or the wonderful thing with psychedelics, is that they um, they augment the capacity of the mind to to feel, to have the impression of a sentience, of a of a mental state in uh, the world that w that we live in. Um, in this sense, for example, last year we we've seen uh, some videos from a psychiatrist in the 50s giving. Uh, um, psilocybin to some people and they were filmed, these people, and they had to recall, they are to describe during the trip their experience uh, with a microphone to record their voice. Eh? So at some point one participant starts feeling uh, engaged with the microphone. The microphone in that moment had a sentience, had a, an intention, he was kind to be there to hear uh, the voice of the participant, so this is also what can happen with psychedelics. Uh, the, uh, uh, an effect on this function of the mind, this, which is to give um, a sentience to, to, some, to something or someone else or outside of our own mind. Compassion implies also prosociality. So we see here again this. So Volimbari is still working on psychedelics and. Uh, he is uh, here working with Catherine Preller, and uh, they, yeah, they are just uh, realizing how psychedelics basically uh, impact the prosociality, and um, it's a very, very interesting article. Because we are all natural-born altruists, um, we could discuss a lot on this. I think a lot of philosophers. Uh, they would not agree. Even a lot of scientists, they would not agree. Um, if we can discuss and if we can also speak up our mind, I am for this uh, perspective and I would argue for that. I would uh, create research and I would share research to argue for that. In any case, the attachment uh, function of the human system is necessary for the humans to develop. Without it, even if they are fed, they will not become human. So we can go check the experiences of Spitz with um, children uh, um, in, in, um, in England after Second World War uh, in orphanotrophy, if it's uh, in English. And we can check also all of these experiences where we find uh, humans that lived in, uh, in, um, in the forest by themselves and then managed to survive. We, would not, we will be not able to uh, let them be fully human as we are here in, in this simple definition of this, even if we educate them afterwards, this particular plastic moment of the, um, of the infancy, where the attachment uh, process is going on the most potently. This is also important because uh, apparently psychedelics, they open up again this uh, plasticity period for uh, all this attachment process. In any case, compassion. Anybody could say anything about compassion as anything else. So what would the Mina bird say? Of course, uh, they also are trained to say the word karuna, which means compassion. So they go around in the, in the island, and at some point uh, we are walking, we, we, we hear karuna. And, ah, yes, I remember. Oh, yes, this is important. Be compassionate. 
But really, anybody could say, could deal about this, uh, this word. So if you are a religious leader, you care about this. If you are a civil disobedient uh, leader, you also use uh, this um, human factor to, to try to, to express uh, uh, your, your vision. If you are an artist, you can also speak about compassion. And even if you are a conservative politician, you can. And uh, really, because uh, compassion is in no means a monopoly uh, for the young socially, so socialists. No monopoly on heart nor on compassion to any given political force. So he is very right. I would wish that uh, politicians use this uh, um, word more and this um, element in their way of thinking and dealing with things and that uh, all of them would have their own share of expressing this. So, what do we do with psychedelics is also to try to um, let people be more flexible cognitively. Maybe wisdom and psychological flexibility are not so different between each other. To consider something rational and reasonable only if it appears to be so in relation to the broadest and deepest norms, those that are considered most essential for the individual and society. Broadest and deepest norms? But this is very general. This is very abstract. What are we understanding from this sentence? So, just take the example of a researcher. A researcher to be doing research with humans, clinical trials, human experimentations, he has to go through a GCP training, good clinical practice. These are a set of ethics principles that every research doing research today around the world has to, to be aware of. They were updated in 2008 from another document that came before. And the other document that came before was the Helsinki Declaration, 1964. In this declaration, again, we had some principles like these broadest and deepest norms that we have to care about if we want to do research with humans. And any given research is uh, trained in a way, it has to know them. But where does the Helsinki Declaration come from? The Helsinki Declaration comes from the Nuremberg Code. The Nuremberg Code came after the Nuremberg trials for the atrocities being made in Second World War. From this uh, trial, not only we since then have the idea of crime against humanity, but uh, from uh, these trials and from the reasoning that humanity did around the Second World War, we had, um, we had the, the, the beginning, the, the creation of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So these are in no means abstract things. These are no general uh, words out there. These are uh, principles. And uh, all totalitarian regimes are rational. So this is the whole point. They are rational, but you cannot consider it rational if it's not wise, if it's not related to these principles. Sorry. Can we study wisdom scientifically? Wisdom is also a really old word. Yes, we can. We can just go check what's happening there. And uh, maybe a case to be made would be that wisdom is very similar to psychological flexibility, which is the ability to contact the present moment more fully as a conscious human being and to change or persist in behavior when doing so serves valued ends. And this is basically the goal of this uh, third wave uh, cognitive behavioral psychotherapy, which is called ACT, 
acceptance and commitment therapy, which is very, which is already used uh, in the framework of psychedelic psychotherapy to really embed the use of substances and of the alteration of state of consciousness in psychotherapy. So this is a psychotherapeutic framework that you can use to merge this uh, um, reasoning around values in psychotherapy. Because psychotherapy is in itself a creation of the human imagination. So at some point someone de started dealing with altered state of consciousness, hypnosis, and uh, invented, uh, after a while, psychoanalysis. Then someone else uh, came and uh, had to deal with peak experience, self-actualization, and um, um, yeah, this idea of, uh, that came out of that, w of flow. Is flow an altered state of consciousness? And then you also had uh, people trying to merge uh, psychotherapy with meditation, mindfulness-based uh, psychotherapy. Today, this is a, a, a practice that is uh, there. And uh, so we are on the verge of seeing uh, psychedelic assisted psychotherapy being applied uh, in this sense as a new form of psychotherapy. If we come back here now, for this conference, I will go through just the situation in Switzerland for now. Um, Switzerland has a wise pro-social flexible drug policy. So this was the report from the Federal Council. And as we can see, uh, I could not find it in, uh, in English and uh, my French is better than my German, so I just wanted to, to be sure for that. Uh, so I put it in French. But as we can see here, uh, hallucinogens and LSD Hallucinogens like LSD, psilocybin, or MDMA are appropriate to treat certain psychiatric troubles. So this is a postulate emitted by the um, uh, Federal Council, which is the most important uh, um, political uh, step of, the, of Switzerland as a state. Um, with intensification, intensification of research, uh, the demand basically to have them more accessible for therapy should uh, increase. So for now, in Switzerland, it is possible to do exceptional use of psychedelics with MDMA, LSD, and psilocybin. Uh, for any given patient, we have to do um, a report. We have to create a, a file for, for that. And um, it's only for treatment-resistant um, problems. Also, uh, you can be treated only if you, are, uh, if you have a valid... Uh, um, Permit séjour, if you have a valid um, document of residency in Switzerland. Also, in any case, just to say it again, uh, psychedelics are not for everyone. They present risks and contraindications. But uh, if you screen uh, uh, the people well, they can have uh, enormous uh, healing potential for many illnesses. Um, Switzerland has... Um, a drug policy matrix, of course, I had to use this word in a presentation like that. And this is um, made on four pillars, which are repression, reduction of risks, prevention, and therapy. Of course, what we are interested in the most here is uh, therapy, because we are dealing with psychedelic psychotherapy. And uh, we enshrined these principles in the creation of the, student, the first student association at uh, the University of Laws. And so you can see here prevention, therapy, and risk reductions. We left uh, the repression to uh, others, because that's not our uh, main um, skill. Um, this was the first one, student association uh, we co-founded. But then, of course, uh, we, as we do in science, uh, we copy-pasted it to have uh, the possibility, to give the possibility to other students in other universities to create their own completely independent student association dealing with uh, um, sharing awareness on psychedelics. So here you can see um, the student association that are validated by their university institutionally um, from Geneva, Lausanne, Fribourg, Neuchâtel, Bern. And uh, uh, for this presentation, I had the pleasure to know that the, um, the files have been submitted also in uh, Zurich University that will have a student association on psychedelics soon. Thank you, Zurich University.
Also, if you happen to know some students from the other universities that would like to um, create their own project, they are welcome to join the Alps Info table and get um, the copy-paste of uh, the status. Of course, having taken some inspiration from this beautiful country that is made out of a federation of uh, cantons, we also wanted to create an institution that can federate this independent entity, also to be able to sustain on the long-term events like this that we created the first time as a student association, but they are, that are really um, engaging for a student association. So that's uh, when we created basically Alps Foundation, which is now a non-profit based in Geneva. Um, this was a, a, an important step, and I think it's uh, very useful. Um, we do uh, aware, we, we share awareness on psychedelics on all the all medias, and we are in contact with the press. We also would like to foster collaborations and the professional domain on psychedelics, of course. And in any case, one thing that we really like uh, is to create uh, a community around this uh, uh, science, around these practices. And uh, what we do is that we will held uh, uh, the Alps Forum in May in Bern. It will always be in Bern. It's a student conference made by students for students, meaning that uh, um, only students will be speakers there in their bachelor, master, or PhD degrees, presenting their own bachelor, master's um, works on psychedelics, since uh, this is possible. And, um, and this would be a, a collaboration that we hope to have, if they want to, with the student associations, of course. Uh, then we are um, creating the, this uh, academic conference that gives away postgraduate credit points to, for the moment, psychologists and medical doctors. Um, the third edition will be in Geneva, where the foundation is based in these dates. Um, then we also thought about creating an event the only event that is reserved to Alps members, so to, become, to be an Alps member, you have to, to, to pay an annual fee as a donation, and then you are invited for free uh, to this event, which revolves around art and science. Uh, this is the only thing that uh, is uh, reserved to Alps members. All the content that we create in all our events uh, is uh, online for free. Um, what is an art and science night? But this is a beautiful moment of uh, um, encountering between uh, scientists that also love music and arts, and artists that also love science and the human uh, quest to understand ourselves. Um, we will, uh, artists will be able to sell uh, and to propose their works, and um, a percentage uh, of this uh, would go uh, to fund research. So the first edition of this uh, gala night will be held in Geneva in this uh, um, incredible location. So you're welcome to join us if you want, the 25th of February 2023. As for today, in these three days, we will have an interdisciplinary um, um, menu of lectures, philosophy, psychology, psychotherapy, neuroscience, anthropology, um, and, uh, of course, this is, uh, th we have this open science principle, so we will put this all for free on the internet. Also, we also care about giving time for questions, so the talks normally will last 40 to 45 minutes, and then we will have 15 minutes for questions. There's, uh, yeah. We will have a uh, patient testimony, someone that undergo through uh, psychedelic-assisted psychotherapy in a group setting legally in Switzerland. We will have a panel discussion, two panel discussions on contemporary issues and psychedelic assisted psychotherapy. In any case, you can find the program in the program all of this. The movie that we will watch, because uh, that's also really cool to offer from our perspective, will uh, be Aware Glimpses of Consciousness. You will see one of the protagonists is Roland Griffith, the first scientist I showed you that uh, started again a little bit this research on psilocybin mystical experience. Uh, on uh, Saturday night we will have a networking uh, like Apero where we can just meet each other. On the side of the practicalities, I should also note that uh, normally we do only in presence uh, speech. Uh, we made uh, two exceptions this year. 
So we are flexible in the end. And the one was for Rick Doblin, which is maybe the most uh, occupied person in the psychedelic field. So uh, he will be speaking on, from, the, yeah, from the screen. And the other one we did for Kim Kuipers that had to come here, but did not for um, personal um, reasons. I would still um, like if you, we could uh, give her a very warm welcome when she will come there. Outside you will find a, an Alps info table, so from this foundation that is creating all of this, um, you can get any kind of information about uh, our structure, what do we do, how we deal with everything. So you're welcome to, to, to go there if you want. I would like to thank you, to thank uh, our partners. I hope you feel this sense of gratitude and this makes you feel good because this is also a way for me to, to feel good in making you feel good in this uh, gratefulness uh, loop that is one of the best emotional loop uh, that a uh, human can experience, eh? which is around uh, thanking the other uh, for, uh, for what he's doing. Around this uh, building uh, today, there is, uh, in these three days, there will be the Swiss Caravan Expo. So you are uh, welcome to go there because with your badge you can get inside for free. And there's a lot of uh, also places to find some foods uh, when, uh, when, if you want to explore in any case. Uh, that maybe could be a very good exercise to do this here and now and feel puzzled and uh, out of this uh, Swiss caravan expo. I mean, uh, that's a thing and um, looking forward to discover. So I guess my, my presentation is uh, getting to the end. Um, I think there's a message uh, that uh, is there about being there for each other that we can express in many, many different ways. So in a scientific quest to understand this uh, sense of connect connectedness to self, others and the world in psychotherapy and uh, in psychedelic uh, use. Uh, we also can express it uh, feeling as uh, lifelong, lifelong uh, students in trying to, to really get uh, people to, to be together and connect. We also can see expressions of this uh, in art and, and uh, poetry and music. So, La vita è l'arte dell'incontro. Das Leben ist die Kunst der Begegnung. La vie, c'est l'art de la rencontre. Life is the art of encounter. Ji tia tse mis jetsvo su stri chei. Jezin eta. Iskutsva Strechi. Thank you for your attention.